The Lord be with you. Happy Daylight Savings Time. <laughs> we always have a low Sunday on the first Sunday after that we change our clocks. Um, our gospel text today is the story of Mary, the sister of Lazarus, the sister of Martha, at a dinner that was celebrating the fact that Lazarus, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, Mary poured a costly jar of nard perfume on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. An extravagant show of love. Uh, Judas Iscariot, the one who would betray Jesus, objected. And uh, he had other desires for the money. And thus our theme today, unholy desires and coveting. I think that's all we need to know. Um, let's prepare our hearts for worship through the brief order of confession and forgiveness. Please rise. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who brings us safely through the sea, who gives us water from the rock, who leads us into the land of milk and honey. Amen. Let us come home to God, confessing our sin. Merciful Father, we have sinned against heaven and before you. We do not fully live as your sons and daughters. We use your gifts to our own ends. Forgive us and restore us, that we may resist all that draws us away from you and be at peace with one another. Amen. We are reconciled to God through Christ for his sake. And for his sake, God does not count our trespasses against us. Once dead in sin, we are now alive to God. Once lost, we are found. God clothes you in the finest robe of all, the righteousness of Jesus Christ, forgiving you all your sins and making of you a new creation. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Share God's peace by greeting those around you.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. be with you. Also with you. Creator God, you prepare a new way in the wilderness, and your grace waters our desert. Open our hearts to be transformed by the new thing you are doing, that our lives may proclaim the extravagance of your love, giving to all through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. from Isaiah. 
Thus says the Lord who makes a, path, a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings out chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things or, or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild animals will honor me, the jackals and ostriches. For I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people who I formed for myself, so that they, <clears throat> so that they might declare my praise. The word of the Lord. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more, circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Abounding in steadfast love, and abounding in steadfast love. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the twelfth chapter. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone. 
She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Unholy desires. Irma Bombeck wrote a column where her, one of her children asks, Mommy, are we rich? And this is what her reply was, or what she said her reply was. You're rich when you can have eight people to dinner and don't have to wash forks between the main course and the dessert. I like that one in particular. Ask Mick what her Valentine's gift for me was. You're rich when your television set has all the knobs on it. I remember our television set having a fork sticking out <laughs> in order to turn it. You're rich when you can throw away a pair of pantyhose just because it has a large hole in it. You're, I, I really like this one. You're rich when your dog is wet and it smells good. Irma Bombeck lets us know that being rich is a frame of mind that has nothing to do with our circumstances. So the question is, how rich are you? Very often, these unholy desires of ours come when we don't think we're rich enough. And the sad thing, you know, a famous quote of um, Rockefeller, richest man in America at the time, and they asked, how much money is enough? And, he always, and his reply was, just a little more, just a little more. And you know, he was never going to be satisfied. So we're going to talk about coveting today. Ninth and Tenth Commandments, you shall not covet. I won't share with you the meanings Martin Luther gives, but the Ninth Commandment, don't covet your neighbor's property. In fact, help your neighbor keep that property and keep it up. And the Tenth refers to don't covet your neighbors, well, we could say mammals, because everything listed, you know, from uh, wife all the way down to um, livestock. Don't covet, covet any of that. You shall not covet anything that is your neighbors. The Hebrew word for covet means desire or to pant after. I think of a dog salivating as you put the, the dish of food down. To pant after. You want it so bad you lose your breath. It takes your breath away. The Greek, it's a thirst of having more. Whatever you have is not enough. I need more. It's a thirst. Now, it is good. Desire is good. We're placed, desire is placed in us. The question is, what do we desire? 
desire what is good. The Apostle Paul says, desire greater spiritual gifts. Covet greater spiritual gifts. Uh, occasionally someone will say, I'm praying for you. And I'll say, I covet your prayers. That's good things we can covet. Judas, he betrays himself in this text. Um, John lets us know that he had unholy desires. He at first says, oh, he should have sold this costly perfume. Just think, 300 denarii. If they made a denarii a day, that's almost a year's wages. A year's wages worth of perfume dumped on Jesus' feet. We all would think, what an extravagant expense. Some people might even say extravagant waste. That's what Judas said. It should have been sold and given to the poor. But in, John says, Judas said that, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He had unholy desires. He coveted more money. And do we have a problem with coveting in our culture? More and more, don't we? Uh, it's a little bit like the Apostle Paul says, I wish I never heard the law because then I wouldn't sin. Well, at least he wouldn't know he sinned. I wish I never saw home and garden TV because then I wouldn't know I have terrible countertops. <laughs> right? You watch these things and you go, oh, I want more. I want to have the best. Or worse yet, I wouldn't know that those gold brass doorknobs I have are out of style. It's now silver. Do we covet? Do we want? Yes. Does it make us happy? No. We're sometimes consumed by it. So I'm going to talk about a cure. We're going to look at the garth. Don't expect you to know what that is. In medieval monasteries, they'd set up these monasteries with a big wall around them and then outbuildings along the wall. And then the inner building had a, a series of hallways and they had a chapel. But in the very center of everything, no windows. It was hard to find, hard to get to. It was a place only the monks could go. It was called the Garth. It was a sanctuary, a place where they could be, pray, meditate, read scripture, and not be distracted by anything. A sacred space a place for prayer, Bible reading, meditation, solitude, and solace. The Garth acted as the keep for the spiritual health and well-being of the community. I'm going to suggest we all need a Garth. And we're not going to find it. You know, it's very often you get in your car, oh, it's so nice and peaceful in here. But there's so many distractions, you can't have it in your car. Place of work, worse. Living room, well that living room might be fine if you didn't have a TV and a dozen other uh, electronic devices. A sacred space, I'm going to suggest, needs to be in our hearts and our minds. Something that keeps us keeps our spiritual sanity and would help us with that nasty, unholy desire of coveting. Philippians 6.6 6 can be broken down into 
three f- f- phrases. Be anxious about nothing. Prayerful in everything. Thankful in anything. Let's look at those three. First, we'll take the, the last one first. Thankful in anything. Can you say, I'm thankful for anything? Dear Abby had a, wrote a, a, printed a letter from a teenager. Dear Abby, happiness is knowing your parents won't kill you if you come home a little late. Happiness is having your own room. Happiness is getting the telephone call you've been praying for. Happiness is something I don't have. And it was signed, healthy, but unhappy and ungrateful. A few days later, Abby printed a second letter. And this time, again from a teenager, a teenager now that showed great maturity. Dear Abby, happiness is being able to walk. Happiness is being able to talk. Happiness is being able to see. Happiness is being able to hear. Unhappiness is reading a letter from a 15-year-old girl who can do all these things and still says she is unhappy. I can talk. I can see. I can hear but I cannot walk. The letter was signed, 13, and happy and grateful. Being able to give thanks in all things. Novelist A.J. Cronin tells of a psychiatrist friend of his who often prescribed the thank you cure to his depressed and frustrated patients. Here's the thank you cure. For six weeks, he would insist that his patient would say thank you for every kindness. And he had to keep, they they would then have to keep a record, a log of every kindness that they said thank you for. And he said he had a remarkable cure rate because all of a sudden people realized how good their life was, realized how much they had to be thankful for. There's something about a gratitude, about gratitude in our hearts that helps us to be thankful helps us with our covetousness. Be prayerful in everything. We should be praying, the Apostle Paul says, constantly. Prayerful in everything. One of my favorite um, theologians, G.K. Chesterton, said, you can say grace before meals. All right. But I say grace before the concert and the opera and grace before the play and pantomime and grace before I open a book and grace before sketching, painting and swimming, fencing, boxing, walking, playing, dancing and grace before I dip the pen in ink. Prayer is to be a way of life for us, a cherished way of life. And it helps us then to cherish every moment. Sometimes I wish our politicians in the debates would stop and say a prayer before they answer a question. 
anxious in nothing. Anxious in nothing. Why? It's all a matter of trust. Psalm 139 is a great psalm that talks about how God is everywhere, everywhere in our lives. Let me read a few verses. O oh Lord, you have searched me, known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down. You are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high, I cannot attain it. The psalmist knew that God was in his life everywhere. It's a God that will not let us go. A God that cares for us so much that he came to be one of us, to be with us, to comfort us. We need not be anxious about anything. So give thanks in all circumstances. Pray continually. Be anxious about nothing. Amen.
Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe believe in God, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended to heaven, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the Amen. Hearing the call to return to the Lord, let us join the whole people of God in prayer for all who cry out in pain and in hope. Holy God, in times of both joy and sorrow, you call us to worship you. Deepen our union with you that in living we may die and in dying we may live with all your saints. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Creative God, you made every living creature and saw that it was good. Teach us to care for the homelands of animals in the wild. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Living God, You require mercy and justice. Bless the work of all organizations. Restore cities and countries, especially Lutheran Volunteer Corps and Lutheran Disaster Response. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Compassionate God, you make a way out of no way. Give your peace and vision to all who struggle with addiction, depression, or illness, especially Joe Boyce, Dan Carlson, Pam Cole, Mel Corlett, Lucy and Lyle Dolly, Sandy Drake, Dorothy, Jennifer R., Ron Fells, Christy Harrison, Debbie Huff, Ellen Malcolm, Chris Marquardt, Willis Melgren, Norma Mueller, Gerald Muller, Denise Newbold, Carly Ott, Warren Ott, Irma Owens, Bennett Shanks, Clarice and Shelby Shores, C.J. Sfigera. Are there any others? God of comfort, make plain that in the midst of suffering, you are suffering, and that your desire is wholeness and life. Give strength and comfort to those who mourn, especially the family and friends of Bonnie Massey, of Sarah... Krieger Wilkinson and of Margaret Schwab. Lord, in your mercy. Shepherding God, you tend your flock with mercy and love. Guide the outreach ministries of this congregation, especially our work with Holland School, Cross Lines, and the Council of Churches. Strengthen our relationships in this community as we serve our neighbors in love. Lord, in your mercy. To you, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your boundless mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.
Let us pray. The Lord be he with you. <clears throat> Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that renewed in the gift of baptism, we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Be holy, holy Lord. Holy God, our living water and our merciful guide, together with rivers and seas, wells and springs, we bless and magnify you. You led your people, Israel, through the desert and provided them water from the rock. We praise you for Christ, our rock in our desert, who joined us, pouring out his life for the world. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his life, death, and resurrection, we await your salvation for all this thirsty world. Pour out your spirit on this holy food and on all the baptized gathered for this feast. Wash away our sin that we may be revived for our journey by the love of Christ. Through him, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. All is ready. It's a second Sunday, so we are communing via intinction, so you will receive the bread or a wafer in your hand, hold on to it, and when the chalice comes by, dip or intinct it into the, into the wine. Our Lord invites us. All is ready. Please come.
Does Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace? Amen. We thank you for gathering and feeding us as a mother hen embraces her young. Release us now to go on our way in these 40 days, ready to see our work as prayer, ready to fast from complacency, and ready to share with those in need. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A couple of things. Um, Abby, our nursery attendant, would like to have Holy Week off, which includes Easter. So if you or anyone you know of would like to be a nursery attendant for any of those services, let me know. Or let the church office know. I'm going to uh, start a new member orientation uh, classes. These will be classes that will also explain uh, um, the Christian faith the way Lutherans understand it, and that will begin the Sunday after Easter. So, um, two weeks from now. If you're interested, let me know. And we're going to try to do that during the Sunday school hour. If that doesn't work, let me know. I think that's all I need to announce. Oh, Wednesday. What happens Wednesday? Noon, we have a Lenten worship service and at 7 p.m. Did you ever notice that daylight savings time always falls on at a time when you're too busy? I had a colonoscopy on Friday morning. I was in Kansas City at the Senate Council meeting until yesterday afternoon and raced back for worship. Oh, and then we went to the symphony last night. I didn't want to lose an hour's sleep. Oh, well. Receive this benediction. The grace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with mercy and give you peace. Amen.
Guided by the gospel, we welcome all to worship, make disciples, hunger for ministry, nurture youth, gather resources for growing ministries, offer healing and care to all in need. Go in peace, remember the poor. I did too. We've got 